Dr. Rosenbaum is a professor of criminology, law, and justice at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He also directs UIC's Center on Research and Law and Justice. A great deal of his professional life has been devoted to bridging the gaps between research and practice to increase the effectiveness of all those engaged in preventing crime and violence. A marvelous summary he has done of what works and what works not so well is contained in his book, The Prevention of Crime, Social and Situational Strategies. I found this book and I thought, oh, this is what I've been looking for. What actually makes a difference? Um, because Dr. Rosenbaum lives in Evanston and has done research about our city's crime prevention strategies, he not only is an expert in this nationally and internationally, but he knows us. He investigates police strategies and the role of citizens in crime prevention and is one of the nation's top authorities on community policing, hotspot policing, school-based prevention, interagency partnerships, IT applications, and even program evaluation. His curriculum vita is 44 pages long, so I will not read it to you. <laughs> uh, but suffice it to say, he knows a great deal, including about our own city, and comes to us today caring about our city and willing to increase our effectiveness by sharing some of what he knows. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosenbaum. Thank you, Joy. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here, and uh, so many familiar faces. I've, uh, my wife and I have lived in Evanston, I think, for about 35 years. I was trying to count. We, raised two daughters here and uh, they've all gone away and we're very proud of them. But um, I do a lot of work around the country. I haven't done much work lately in Evanston, but uh, I love being here and uh, I'm delighted to be able to help in any way I can. Um, the other person I'm indebted to here, Bill Logan, uh, who brought me to the Evanston Police Department in the early eight, in the late 70s. And uh, so I worked there for a few years and learned a lot about police. Uh, and that got me interested in a lifelong uh, effort to study them. And now we have uh, one big study that's in 100 cities, actually, and Evanston is one of them. And so I'm glad Chief Eddington's here, and uh, we're delighted that Evanston's part of that. Um, uh, as a criminologist uh, and uh, psychologist, I've been blessed with the opportunity to think about crime and disorder uh, from an academic standpoint and to reflect on the causes of violence and and, and give some attention to the ways of preventing crime, especially police responses and community responses. Uh, in some of my earlier work, uh, as Joey points out, uh, I laid out some of the ways that we might be able to achieve this goal working in uh, community crime prevention. And if you don't mind, I just want to reminisce a little bit about this work. So some of the, you, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I, I've been to cities all over the country and in these exercises, there would be like three pieces of paper on that one, two on this, and one over here. So the fact that you have all these things uh, tells me just how much is going on in Evanston. Uh, much of the work that's been done, and, and Dan Lewis knows this too over the last 30, 40 years, is focused on ways to protect yourself, actually. from uh, It confirms a lot of conventional wisdom we have about street smarts, avoiding dangerous areas, avoiding people that are up to no good, staying not staying out too late, what you tell your kids basically as parents. Uh, and being aware of your environment, I would tell them today, don't be talking on your cell phone while you're walking down the street, don't walk alone, etc. All smart advice consistent with what we call routine activities theory, which tells us that crime happens because three factors converge. There's a motivated offender, a suitable target or victim, and the absence of guardianship. All of those are potential areas you should have thought about, I'm sure, and seek to remove these problems. Second, the research tells us how to protect our property, our homes, our cars, our jewelry, lock our doors, keep our lights or music on when you're out for the evening. Maybe you don't know that one, but you should. Uh, giving me what we call the appearance of occupancy. It does reduce violence. I don't need to do that because I have an 85 pound dog. Uh, so he's very uh, protective. 
But finally, we have research on how to protect your neighborhood. Uh, neighborhood watches, foot patrols, you're all familiar with these. They're all good ideas overall. In fact, Dan and I did some research on this in Chicago in the 1980s. And uh, despite the unfortunate events that you heard about in Florida with Trayvon Martin and Zimmerman, uh, neighborhood watch has gotten a bad reputation. It's not your typical volunteer for neighborhood watch Zimmerman. Uh, and of course, this is also where the police come in. Uh, we count on them to protect us and our neighborhoods. In Evanston, we have a, the good fortune of having an outstanding police force and excellent leadership with Chief Eddington. But one thing I've learned over 30 years of studying this is that the community, uh, as a community, we tend to rely too much on the police. Our goal should be to create self-regulating neighborhoods where we feel confident in our ability to maintain order, what we call informal social control, and collective efficacy. Research has shown that neighborhoods where collective efficacy is high, that is where people feel inclined to intervene, to prevent delinquent acts, have low levels of violence, uh, much <coughs> substantially lower than where collective efficacy is low. We tend to rely on the police to exercise formal social control when our insti social institutions that should regulate our behavior, our families, schools, community organizations, etc., are weak. So we need to engage in crime prevention in everything that we do and stop expecting the police to do everything. The police are great at what they do, but they can't do it alone and they are often called upon after the fact to clean up the mess. Uh, however, police community partnerships are great uh, where we co-produce public safety as a product and that is a very laudable goal and I think Evans has been very strong in this area over the years. Again, uh, starting way back when Bill Logan was chief, uh, lots of community oriented efforts and I, I can see by the people that are here from talking to them, there's a lot of that uh, going on. Um, another big problem with the existing crime prevention activities though is that too often they're narrowly focused on us. I think that's what I've alluded to here. How, how we can selfishly protect ourselves, our family, and our property from the bad guys. Um, we call these defensive strategies. I think Dan called it that years ago actually in a paper. Um, how, we can how we can circle the wagons and protect what we have. Don't get me wrong, these are important and effective strategies. We have evidence of that. Uh, used more often though by those at the upper end of the education and income uh, continuum. Uh, aside from the unequal pr distribution of security hardware, where we spend more today on private security in America than we do on public security, we spend very little time thinking about why our communities are facing crime problems, who are the bad guys, quote unquote, what motivates them, and what causes violence in the first place. We just want to be safe and forget about these bigger questions and let the police deal with it. Now I know this group is not like that or you wouldn't be here. Uh, you actually care about the larger community in which you live beyond your front doorstep. You care about improving the quality of life for all members of the Evanston community, whether they are at risk of victimization, at risk of offending, or neither. Uh, we need more people to think that way, but having you here is a start, so let's if we can go a little bit down this road a short distance today, let me talk for a few minutes about the prevention of violence. I'm glad to see the prevention one is fuller than the other two, but they're all parts of prevention, actually different levels, primary, secondary, tertiary prevention, as we call it. Um, uh, people, I'm always surprised after all these years that people, uh, uh, educated people are befuddled by violence. They, I hear them say, well, maybe we would do something if we knew what the problem was or if violence wasn't so elusive or so complicated and so difficult to understand. As a society, we act as if we have no idea what caused it or how to prevent it. And as criminologists, of course, we kind of laugh at that because we find that funny because it's pretty clear from extensive research over the last hundred years and historical analysis what's going on. We know a lot about violence. So let me just quickly summarize uh, hundreds of studies that have identified eight major factors, clusters of factors that contribute to our current levels of violence in America. Number one is poverty and unemployment. In the big cities especially, we've experienced enormous loss of industrial jobs in the last century, leading to unemployment, leading to poverty in certain neighborhoods. To this end, we have never adequately addressed the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots created by economic opportunities, uh, which data clearly suggest is much wider than it was you know, 30 years ago. 
The second is out-migration of the middle class from the inner cities. Both black and whites fled to the suburbs in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. This has started to reverse, but we have the gentrification problem, which further isolates the poor, and we have still concentrated poverty, which is a big factor contributing to crime, which leads to the third factor, which is urban segregation by race, and racism associated with that. Schools, housing, employment discrimination, all very well documented in the history of America. And the damage had, this has caused has been dip, extensive and difficult to measure, but as a psychologist, I can also say it has an enormous effect on self-esteem among people of color and others who are adversely affected, feeling rejected. I think back to the Brown versus Board of Education decision in the early 1950s, saying that Felicity B. Ferguson from the 1890s was separate but equal, was not separate but equal. But those studies, again, science played a role. The Clark studies, they brought in studies showing that young African-American kids, uh, girls, preferred playing with white dolls than brown dolls. And it was compelling evidence at that time uh, that, uh, of the effects of, of discrimination. Um, and that affected the court, I think, in that decision. Uh, point number four, the failure of urban schools to prepare kids for a service economy. We still have tremendous variation in the quality of schools by neighborhood around this country. Evanston, not so much. I mean, we have good schools in Evanston. But kids need fundamental skills to be successful, especially when their families have failed them to some extent, or they have difficult families. Point number five, family breakdown, caused by poverty, incarceration, lack of male role models, leading to drug abuse, family violence, neglected parenting, negligent parenting, excuse me, teen pregnancy, and other problems. The public health officials and others talk about the comorbidity of these problems. They're not random. They, people who have one tend to have the other. They're all related. Uh, we have, as a result, have lots of poor parenting because of these factors. I'm not blaming the family. I can get to that later. But number six, community breakdown. Social disorganization, instability, high turnover, created a loss of community, a loss of informal social control that regulates behavior that I was just alluding to earlier. Too many unsupervised youths on the street in particular areas. And the stress of urban life on kids is nothing new. We not only now have a bunch of researchers at UIC and other places that are documenting how kids are traumatized by violence, but the stress of urban life on kids, we can go back, I, I cite here, uh, Thrasher's classic book on the gang, published in 1927, a sociological study of gangs in Chicago and why young males join gangs as a substitute for the failures of society, social institutions. Gangs are a byproduct of disintegrating families, educational failure, non-existent employment opportunities, exclusion from conventional activities, etc., etc. I don't need to tell you this, but it's important for us to remember. It gives them a home, some status, some identity, I can be somebody as a gang member. Number seven, today, the growth of mass culture, entertainment, media, sports, has endorsed violence as a solution to problems, endorsing gangster imagery and supporting the objectification of women as sexual toys. Violent video games today have become a much bigger industry than movies or television. I added that one, actually. <laughs> Number eight, the ready availability of violence facilitators, drugs and guns, and not specifically. We have an unlimited supply of these criminogenic commodities that contribute to violence. Okay, despite this understanding, we still look upon families and individuals prone to violence and crime as willful and destructive forces that have chosen this lifestyle. To protect our meritocracy, we hold strongly to our belief in a just world where people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. We justify our existence, our wealth, our status by saying, I worked harder, I'm better, I went to try it harder than those people who are tired, lazy, whatever. It's not that simple as I just got done saying. Yet if any one of us were born into a neighborhood or family defined by high poverty, high drug abuse, family violence, unsupervised youth, how do you think you would act and turn out? Not very different. Let's turn our attention briefly to strategies to deal with troubled youth, especially since you're, this is part of why you're here. We talked about, I have here suppression, intervention, and prevention. It's kind of similar. 
Suppression is what the police often do in all cities that is important. Uh, professional, well-trained officers who would turn up the heat on repeat offenders and hot spots of violence. But they need to be careful, of course, to avoid widening the net to at-risk kids who, who do give them a record. I didn't want to get off on this today, but I can. we have research that's saying arresting adults doesn't really have much impact on them, but arresting juveniles does. It's, it's arguably a crim criminogenic activity. So we now know that arresting juveniles increases, not decreases, their probability of future offending. So think about that. We have to be careful with, with, with juveniles about thinking of alternatives. And Evanston has all kinds of alternatives, and that's great. Focusing on hot spots and hot offenders can work under some conditions. It disrupts gun markets, and I work with Chicago a lot, the superintendent of Chicago, and Chicago recovers three times as many guns as Los Angeles and six times as many guns as New York. But since that's our neighbor, you should just think about how many guns are nearby. Uh, the gang enforcement is a mixed bag and threatens, threatening the whole gang assumes they're a cohesive group, which they aren't really anymore. Uh, removing leaders can create disorganization and violence and cliques. All of it, a lot of it's based on deterrence models. We threaten punishment. We assume that young kids are rational thinkers about risk of future punishment, but 15-year-olds on the street are kids with brains that are not fully developed, we now know from the latest MRIs. <laughs> And uh, they don't think that way. Uh, uh, Chicago and Evanston police are doing their best to arrest offenders and have them prosecuted, the serious offenders, and have done a very good job, I might add. But the biggest problem is that many of these efforts are not long-term solutions because they do not address the underlying conditions that contribute to violence that I outlined earlier. I'm sure the chief here would agree with me that the uh, that uh, we cannot arrest our way out of the problems of violence and disorder. The community must play a key role. Second, interventions uh, with offenders and high-risk youth. We have many of these around the country on streets. These programs seek to interrupt violence, prevent retaliation. Ceasefire in Chicago for violence is a very good example using former gang members to intervene. We tend to rely, though, on single approaches. Ideally, we need these comprehensive services. We need to attack the problem on all fronts. I think that's why you're here in schools, businesses, churches, community groups, social service agencies. We need good education, jobs, recreation, after school programs, skills training. And uh, it's wonderful actually to be here in Evanston and to see that um, all of the groups that are, that are here, you know, family focused, the YMCA, YOU, family, uh, fam, these, that these have existed. I've been here 35 years and they've been around pretty much the whole time. I don't know why he's been around here and Bill, not you, but the why, for a lot longer than that. Um, so it's a wonderful, there is some sense of institutionalization here that I, that I don't see it, uh, sometimes in other cities. Things come and go with the latest grant and that's it. Um, but community members are also important. Watches, marches, the community must establish norms about what's acceptable. People call me all the time because I did all this research saying that the D.A.R.E. program is ineffective and actually increases drug use among kids. And um, they're like, what are you saying? But anyway, uh, but they come, they call me from all over the country saying, well, what are we supposed to do about drugs? And I said, well, your community should establish norms about what's acceptable behavior uh, and what's tolerated. And what, how, you know, alcohol is a bigger problem than marijuana. We just never kind of deal with these problems. But, you know, the, 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 there's, the community is important. You can't count on the police to just come in and arrest everybody. That may be not what the community wants that we have to decide collectively what the norms are. The police are an instrument of society. Um, okay, we must learn uh, to work with the police to report suspicious activity. The no snitch culture must be attacked directly. If fear is the driving force, then develop anonymous channels. If distrust of the police is the issue, then deal with it. Uh, for example, I've helped Chicago develop a training program to build public trust and confidence and better car side manners. Uh, in, for recruits that come through their training academy. Uh, number three, primary prevention. This is where we need to be creative and invest most of our resources, in my opinion. The earlier research is shown across a wide variety of fields that the earlier the intervention in the life course of individuals at risk, the greater the effects and the more money we save. It's, you get a bigger bang for your bucks working with a 10-year-old than you do with an 18-year-old. Um, it won't pay off for decades, 
And that's a political problem in America, as we refuse to invest in it because the next election is coming up before you see any results. Uh, but we do need to do it, and we need leadership that's willing to take that risk. Just a few examples. Prenatal care can be related to future offending. Small birth weight, poor nutrition, exposure to violence in the home. They're all bad for babies. They increase the probability of a difficult life and delinquency. Teen mothers should be a key target group. Preschool. Research shows that good preschool is really important for lowering kids' risk of getting in trouble and dropping out of school later. The Perry Preschool Program in Michigan has gotten much attention over the years, showing arrest rates of these kids from preschool are much lower, you know, 10, 15 years later, 20 years later. Um, we have to ask ourselves, how much do we care? How much are we willing to help high-risk families and kids? How do, when are we willing to break the cycle of intergenerational violence that's passed down from mother to child, generation after generation? I think of Bill Logan. I put a note here because when I used to work with him years ago, he would tell me these stories of that he, growing up in Evanston. And you've been through, you know, went to Evanston High School and all this stuff. Intergenerational violence and gangs problems. He, he, he knows the grandmothers, the mothers, the daughters, I mean, the sons, fathers, whatever. It goes on and on. You have to break the cycle at some point. When are you going to help that teen mother not be like somebody else that was her role model? Okay. Um, that, well, there's been a lot written about intergenerational violence lately. Kathy Whittem is going to read her work. Um, elementary school. If you reduce class size, you improve outcomes. All this stuff is well documented. If you change instructional practices, kids will benefit. There's research to, uh, for example, success for all. Reading 90 minutes per day for elementary school kids makes a big difference. <clears throat> Family prevention. Home visits by nurses, by others, to high-risk families, helping them with their changing their diapers for teen mothers, whatever it is. There's a lot of different angles on that. But that work has been shown to be effective. It makes a difference. Uh, one example. Uh, Chicago, University of Illinois Chicago, my own campus, the Safe Children's Program, family-based counseling and weekly tutoring will improve reading scores and increase parental involvement in school. So we, we know that comprehensive school programs are also more effective than individual programs, so we need to change school culture, environment. Uh, I'm great, I'm really excited that you have restorative justice programs here in Chicago, or in Evanston, excuse me. I was thinking peer juries, I've looked at Chicago in the schools, wonderful program to get the students actually involved in regulating the behavior of other students. We, you know, they wanted us to evaluate and say, well, does this help the kids that are coming in as delinquents? It's really helping the kids on this peer jury. They're the ones learning to be adults. And it, it's, it's moving. Okay. Um, but there's a lot in restorative justice that I'm glad that Evanston's doing some of that important work. Uh, many examples of su successful programs to prevent violence and delinquency in America. I encourage you to Google Blueprints for Violence Prevention. It's uh, at the Center for the Study of Prevention and Violence at the University of Colorado at Boulder, launched all the way back in 1996. Today, the research team there has identified on their website more than 450 programs that are effective and show promise in preventing violence. That's bl Blueprints for Violence Prevention. And there are many others. Coalitions and partnership. I want to let me close by talking about that since that's what you're about. I've actually done a number of studies locally and mostly nationally on coalitions uh, over the years, um, violence coalitions. I, there's a chapter I wrote in 2011 in the Oxford Handbook of Crime Prevention uh, called Comprehensive Community Partnerships for Preventing Crime. I don't know if I want you to read it. It's a bit academic and pedantic, but uh, you might like, I have a lot of references in there to major review articles in other fields, especially health, public health, documenting the conditions under which coalitions are effective and ineffective. First, just a couple quick things. Comprehensive efforts seek to address the, why are these important? You already know this, but I'm just going to say it. They seek to address the problem from all sides if possible. The problem of violence is complex, but it is understandable. There are multiple causes, so why not address uh, many different causes? Uh, using as many different service providers as possible, the police, schools, social service, the community groups, etc. Second, these partnerships are community oriented, uh, meaning they acknowledge that family and neighborhood conditions, uh, I think um, Miguel Lee pointed that out too, uh, that, that the uh, family and neighborhood stability is influenced by different levels of social control and social support provided by the community. Uh, they seek to strengthen the capacity of local institutions to improve individual and family functioning. 
Research on coalitions and partnerships indicates that they are difficult to start and sustain for a host of reasons. We spent more time at our table talking about all the things that can go wrong with coalitions, and there are a number of number of things that we. And it's important for you to acknowledge those and, and and deal with them. You know, there's turf issues. There's metrics. You each have your own metrics. You're pointing out. It's like different things that you have to deal with. Uh, competition for funding. Uh, let's be honest about these kinds of things. But there's a, a number of conditions that contribute to successful interagency and community coalitions that I've identified. To be effective, they require first a supportive startup environment. That includes adequate funding and preferably a history of collaborative partnerships. I find that in cities that start these things where the agencies haven't worked together before, it, that, it's that relationship thing. You know, you just, if you don't have it, it's, it's hard to, you'll come to the meetings, you'll send somebody to the meeting, but you're just doing it to show that you're not oppositional. There's actually, I have a chart that shows levels of cooperation from, you know, we all love each other, we work together every day, and at the other end we just, we're, we're trying to undermine each other at the meeting. And in the middle they're kind of, well, we'll go there and we'll talk to them, but we're not going to really do anything. Um, I served as dean of a school of criminology for a while, and I, I learned to say that, is there anything I can do short of providing any real assistance? I'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Some people come to coalitions doing that. Um, okay, a common, let's see, okay. Uh, supportive environment. Uh, a common purpose or mission that unifies all participating agencies. You alluded to that already. Uh, a lead agency that's respected by their groups and can champion the cause. That's kind of important. A formalized structure, including steering and working committees. Mechanisms to communicate effectively with members. Members Today it could be internet, it could be a website, it could be whatever. Um, a commitment to evidence-based practices and prevention science. Now that, I'm pulling out my union card as a researcher here, but the research does support the importance of research. <laughs> How surprising. It's like saying, <laughs> teachers support the existence of teachers. Okay. Um, but those coalitions that have, kind of what you guys were alluding to earlier, needs assessment, identifying which of these are your priorities, where are you going to invest your energy, documenting the process, having some indicators, what is the success? What, how would you define success as a group in this coalition? Do you need specific outcomes, redu reductions in truancy at the school, you know, drug use? All these things, by the way, are all related to violence, so you can't separate violence out from these things. Uh, or is it just working together successfully? But I think having a, anyway, in the drug area, for example, there's a lot of research that come and help define what the causes of drug abuse and who gets involved and which programs are effective and which ones are not. So there's a lot of push now in a lot of fields for evidence-based practice, even in medicine, right? We don't want to just do things that used to be done just because we did them for 100 years. We want to do them because they work and they're effective. And so I think uh, the government also, the U.S. Department of Justice has a timesolutions.gov, I think. You can go there and learn about programs that work and don't work. I was disappointed they put the D.A.R.E. program up there as ineffective and said, call me. And I was like, oh my God. But you didn't ask my permission to put my name on there. Okay, um, in Evans, let's see, did I finish that? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, in Evanston, I think you have a unique opportunity here to make a difference. The problems are not so severe as to be absurdly unmanageable, as I, ha as I have seen in many large cities, and the resources are sufficient that the dosage of treatment might be strong enough if applied in a coordinated and systematic manner. I think it already has been. I really think it's important to say Evans has been doing this for 40 years or something already, and you've probably prevented a million cases of delinquency. But I think that there's another level, which is both your coordination and sharing of what you're doing, maybe even inventory of programs that you currently have and how they can be referred and work together better. I know there are coordination problems with sharing information about juveniles and all that. But I also think there, one, my one thought would be, um, I would give more attention, I would keep all that in place so you don't have bigger problems emerge, but I would give more attention probably to these high risk families and kids who, there's a lot of research in criminology showing they account for a disproportionate number of all the problems. I mean, ask a school teacher about the two kids out of 30 that are the problem. It just, just disrupts everything. You know, Dan knows this up years ago, Wolfgang did research showing next. 7% of the arrestees counted for like 50% of the violence in Philadelphia. You know, it's like, 
there are these re Chicago. They've now systematically identified it. There's like 1,500 kids who are all networked, and now they're going to their door and saying, "We're guessing in the next six months you're either going to be dead or you're going to have killed someone and go to prison for life." You know, so let's talk. Uh, but that's not the way you do it either. But you, you basically, you know, you have to. Uh, and again, the early intervention is even more effective, I think, with the young families. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, Malcolm Gadwell, Gladwell excuse me, talked about tipping points in his book by that title that many of you have probably read, a point in time and space where a convergence of forces can make a huge difference in the outcome, the perfect storm, if you will, of interventions and social forces. I think you can achieve this in violence prevention through partnerships that seek to prevent violence by creating environments that are supportive of the development of healthy, happy, self-confident children and families. At the same time, we must continue to engage in mindful community crime prevention and reduce opportunities for crime through surveillance and supervision of youthful behavior. And youth programs even do that. We also need to continue access control. We need to reduce signs of disorder in the community. Uh, I haven't even talked about any of that, broken windows theory. You know, it's kind of like we do need to, my neighborhood, I once gave a talk in my neighborhood a couple years ago and I said, you know, make sure you get rid of the graffiti, get rid of the garbage on the streets, clean up the you know, broken window theory says one broken window left undetected leads to many, un unrepaired leads to many broken windows quickly. We have a lot of research to support that idea. And so, even I, li I live right behind Shute School, and the sixth graders come by and drop, you know, cans and garbage on my lawn all the time. But I don't leave it there, I pick it up immediately, because otherwise it'll become a place where everybody dumps, you know. So, we all need to do these minor things in our lives to keep. And to communicate. Why do we care about that, by the way? Lots of research at Northwestern, Dan Lewis's research, others showing that um, disorder and graffiti and all of this create fear of crime. And they also lead us to withdraw and leave our parks open to just the kids that are more likely to cause trouble. We need to use our neighborhoods. We need to use our parks. We need to establish authority and control over those areas as adults. Um, Finally, I want to be realistic. There's no panacea for violence prevention, and we're unlikely to secure all the resources needed to address all the social, economic, and political complexities that define the problem. But you have a good problem in Evanston, which is that you've already traveled a great distance down this road of preventing crime by providing all these programs and services. And of course, um, coordinating this is important. And I just want to end, I guess, with saying there's always room for improvement. I, I think of the public health model. Actually, I think of a guy, John McKnight. I don't know if John's still at Northwestern or not. Retired, but he had an influence on me when I was a professor at Northwestern years ago. And, uh, you know, talking about getting doctors together to talk about what we need to do to improve the health of America. And the whole first day of the conference, all they focused on was we needed more uh, MRIs, and we need better equipment, and we need better training and facilities and all that. And then the next day, he says, now, how are we, what do you need to do to improve the health and longevity of the American people? Isn't that what your goal is? And I said, yeah. They said, oh, that's pretty easy. It's diet, exercise, don't smoke, you know, don't be too stressful. Overwhelming evidence, right, of these as the causes of poor health. As important as our nurses and doctors are, as important as our police officers are, uh, in the end, uh, the public is what contributes to healthy behavior and, and, and safe environments. All right, thank you very much. Enjoyed talking to you.